Okay, welcome back. Uh, welcome to Fractional Stable Homotopy Theory. And uh, last time we saw a very important theorem, which is what I call stability. And that uh, in spectra, well, actually stability is a bunch of other properties, but the most important, uh, if we have a square, then, sorry, then it is a pullback square if and only if it is a push-on square. Technically speaking, stability is the existence of the zero object, the existence of pullbacks, push-outs, and this property. But uh, this property is definitely the main ingredient. OK. Uh, we will call such squares Uh, exact squares. And so sometimes I might say pull back or push out uh, if, if the situation makes it seem more natural, but I'll try to use exact squares in general. And okay, and let me throw at you a small piece of terminology. So, okay. So let's see. I don't remember if I defend this before. I think not. So let's see. Be an infinity category. Uh, an exact sequence is a square from x prime goes to x goes to x double prime goes to zero. That is both. Pull back and push out. And um, in general, it's called a cofiber sequence when it's a push out and a fiber sequence when it's a pullback. I think I did already introduce this terminology. Um, and uh, but when it's both, uh, we call it an exact sequence and. Uh, the motivation is the following example. So if C is, uh, I don't know, the category of abelian groups or more generally uh, any abelian category, an exact sequence is exactly, pun not intended, a short exact sequence. You can check the condition that is a pullback. It's telling you that X prime is the kernel. So if I put names here, F and G, the condition is a pullback. It tells you exactly that F, F is the kernel of G and the condition is a push out. It's telling you that G is the co-kernel of F. And the first isomorphism theorem does the rest. For spectra, we have a lot more exact sequences uh, because it's a lot easier for a square to be both a pullback and a push out by the stability property that we have seen. Okay. Good. Um, Note that, uh, actually, let me put a quick remark. In a one category, this condition that, that, that this is a square and not just two maps, it's just a property. I'm just saying that G composed with F is zero. In, uh, it's a zero map. In infinity categories, like in spectra, this is actually more structure. I'm giving you a homotopy of GF with the zero map. Um, and I, I, the, the reason I spent through all this problem of setting up these all these theory of coherent diagrams is that I can sort of forget about this. Uh, the formalism sort of keeps track of it, keeps track of it for you, but it's it's good to remember uh, that this is actually part of the data. It's not something I'm forgetting. 
Okay. And of course, when I say if C is ab, I mean the nerve of ab. But as I mentioned before, I'm going to stop using the nerve at some point. You should have also done the exercise that's telling you that the nerve is fully faithful from categories to simplicial sets. So this is really, really not an abuse of notation. I mean, or is a painless abuse of notation at least. OK. Questions? No. Perfect, because it's time to define the homotopy groups of a spectrum. I think uh, that's been long enough. So if E is a spectrum, it's uh, nth homotopy group. is the group, so pi n, oh, sorry, n, and in, any integer, n can also be negative. Sorry, this is important. So pi n of E is homotopy classes from the nth suspension of the sphere spectrum into E, or equivalently pi m plus n E m, for m greater or equal than minus n. That's because that, that, that it's independent of m, because uh, as you know, uh, e m is just omega e m plus one. Therefore, p m plus n e m is p m plus n omega e m plus one is pi n plus one plus n e m plus one. So this is actually well defined. And this sphere spectrum, I'm pretty sure I defined it already, but let me just put it here. It's just a suspension spectrum of S node, and therefore its nth suspension is just the suspension spectrum of S n. Well, that's for, for n greater or equal than zero. This definition actually makes sense also for n less than zero. Because remember, we defined S n as omega minus n for n negative. Sorry, sigma n. Sigma n minus n for n less than zero. Because we saw that sigma and omega are inverses, so this definition makes sense. And note that these are all abelian groups because you can take m greater or equal than 2 minus n, for example. So I can write it remark pi m e, for example, pi, let's say 2 e uh, m minus 2 is an abelian group. It has a canonical abelian group structure. And as an example, let's say pi n of the Allen-Bramer-Klein spectrum is, is 0 for n different than 0 and a for n equal 0. We saw this before because so in, in, a, in a moment, actually, perhaps a more conceptual way of thinking about it. But okay. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, uh, did we define the square brackets? Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I mean, just the, the homotopy classes of maps. Sorry. Uh, we define, I think we defined it when we defined the homotopy category. I don't remember if I introduced this notation, but I okay. thought I did. But in any case, I just mean homotopy classes of maps. Uh, nothing, nothing mysterious.
And this actually comes by the universal property of the suspension spectrum. And the fact that sigma is an inverse, like this is, uh, how can it be? This is, if you want, this is same thing as homotopy classes from sigma m plus m to sigma m e, and then you use the, the universal property of the suspension spectrum. Actually, maybe I should do it more explicitly, let me. No, let me do it more explicitly here. It's the same thing as this because sigma is an equivalence. That's the same thing as pi note maps sigma infinity s m plus m it's in spectrum sigma m of e same things pi note maps of pointed spaces s m plus m omega infinity sigma m e and that's pi m plus m e m because omega infinity sigma m e is just e uh, sorry, this is just E m, is the nth space, because sigma is given by the shift and omega takes the zeroth space. Oh yeah, okay. And this formula counts, this formula for the mechanical inspection counts because this is <coughs> pi m plus m of k a m. So. Okay. Questions about this? Let me first then give you an important property, lemma, what I call the Whitehead theorem for spectra. Oh, no, wait, I, I need another example first. Uh, sorry. That's because this is, in, this is one of the exercises. Uh, so let X be a pointed space. Then the pi N of sigma infinity X well, no, I don't think it's an, ex an exercise, sorry, is uh, pi n, well, for, for n great is, uh, is zero, if n is less than zero, and the stable pi n of x for n greater or equal than zero. So you can see that this is because this, remember we discussed, this guy is just, pi n q x, where q was this omega infinity, sigma infinity space we discussed, and that's exactly sigma infinity x zero. And these, I, I leave, this condition here, I leave it as an exercise for you. It's not hard. It follows from Blaker's Massey. Actually, that's an overkill, but it definitely follows from, from Blaker's mass. Oh, well, let's say it follows from Huribis, actually. It's probably easier. It's just the fact that suspension of, of spaces are connected. It's, uh, actually, yeah, let me put, uh, let me put it, let me put it actually, this is probably sigma y is, let me put this follows from because p is by zero sigma y is zero for every one. And you, yeah, for, from these, you can backtrack the definition and see that. But okay. Yeah, sorry, that was an important example. I almost forgot. In fact, I forgot to write it in the notes. That's what I almost forgot to say it. I'll add it in the notes after the class is over. Okay. Oh, I 
from that image you've hardened them. Of course, to go from unstable to stable homotopy groups, you need to hardened them. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, why that theorem? So let f from E to F uh, be a map of spectra. Then F is an equivalence if and only if pi n of F is an isomorphism for every n uh, z. Uh, note that uh, homotopy groups of spectra do not depend on the base point. There is no base point choice here. This is sort of smothered out by the stability uh, situation. So I just have one abelian group for every n in the definition. And there is no action of pi one on, on other groups or any other fancy thing like that. It's just a graded abelian group. Okay, proof. Uh, I'll give you all the details except for one thing. So, so F is the datum, you know, of Fn for every n in Z, and then homotopies like this, if you recall. And then exercise, it's enough to show that Fn has, uh, sorry, is an equivalence for every n. The exercise is, uh, if you can find an inverse for Fn for every n, then you can also find uh, homotopies that assemble this inverse into a map of spectra. That's not hard, it's just understanding how composition in these mapping spaces work. I mean, okay, one thing is uh, if Fn is uh, homotopic to the omega of Fn plus one, then the inverse of Fn is homotopic to omega of the inverse of Fn plus one, and you can transfer the homotopy, and then you just need to, to write, to, to check that the compositions are indeed the identity, also the level of homotopies. You need to choose the, the homotopies of the inverse carefully. But that's not what I'm most interested. I want to show, I want to tell you why these Fn's are indeed equivalences. And that is because, so notice that Fn from pi star of En relative to the base point is an isomorphism for every n. But that's not enough, right, to say that this is an equivalence, because classical whitehead needs for every base point. So you need to be a bit more careful. This implies not that Fn is an equivalence, but that Fn is an equivalence when restricted to the connected components of the base point. Right? Because at least that much we have. You know that you can check for every, exactly for one point in each connected component. Now we can't. We only understand uh, one connected component, one of the base points, but that much we have. This is classical whitehead. But that implies that omega Fn is an equivalence. Fm. from omega En to omega Fn is an equivalent, since omega En and omega Fn depend only on the connected component of the base point. But that's just Fn minus one. So Fn minus one is an equivalence for every N in Z. 
but okay, that's just re-indexing now. Yeah, that's what we want. So the point of these, if you want, is that uh, stabilizing sort of eats up all these base point issues that are very important in unstable homotopy theory. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that you can always forget about base point issues. Base point issues pop out from time to time, uh, but not while doing these things, thankfully. This is, this is fixing it. Excuse me, um, f n minus one is not exactly equal to omega f n. But... Okay, okay, it is canonically homotopic. So if one is an okay. equivalence, the other is. Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't have said equal, but I mean there is a canonical homotopy between the two that comes with the data of f. So okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Questions? No. And then let me put another, well, okay, that's more of a remark actually, but so let E prime goes to E goes to E double prime, an exact sequence of spectra. then there exists a long exact sequence of homotopy groups. And in fact, you would be surprised by how many long exact sequences of groups arise secretly from, a, from an exact sequence of spectra. Pretty much almost all of them. Don't say all of them because you could contrive some examples, but it's a, ultimately the source of most of the long exact sequences you know. And that's because If E prime, e, e double prime is an exact sequence, then omega infinity sigma n E prime, omega infinity sigma n E, omega infinity sigma n E double prime is a fiber sequence of pointed spaces. That's because, well, sigma n is an equivalence and so preserves exact sequences and omega infinity is a right adjoint. So preserves pullback diagram, pullback squares. And, uh, and, there, and then this, this arises from the less of a vibration in homotopy that we have seen last semester. And of course, for every n, you just get a fragment. You get the, the sequence from pi n onwards from pi minus n onwards because pi star of omega infinity sigma n e is pi star minus n of e by the formula. Remember this is just e n. But then you can 
glue together these sequences as n varies and you get a long exact sequence for every star in Z. Okay. Questions? No, perfect. So now let me define the last two objects that we're going to need, the internal home in spectra and the tensor product of spectra. And after that, and a couple of properties of them, we are off to the races. So that's E, F, B to spectra. The mapping spectrum map E, F into spectrum is the spectrum which is given its nth space is the mapping space from E to sigma n of F. And, delta, and the gluing maps are just the equivalences E omega sigma sigma n of f that's because omega and sigma are inverse equivalences and then you can move the omega out okay this defines a spectrum at the very least And let's see a remark. So let E be a spectrum and X be a pointed space. Remember that we had a notion of, you know, the a cohomology theory associated with the spectrum, which was E n of X was defined as homotopy classes of maps of pointed spaces from X. E n. This bracket star, I mean homotopy classes of pointed spaces. And this is just, well, by definition, is pi note of maps in pointed spaces from X to E n. So far, I haven't done anything, but let me remark that this E n is, well, equivalent or equal depending on exactly which model you use for your suspension to omega infinity sigma and e remember again because sigma is just shifting and omega is taking the zero space and so now we can take pi zero of the map in spectra from sigma infinity x sigma and e But that's just pi zero of the nth space here. And that's just, well, that's by definition pi minus n of this space here. 
So in fact, cohomology groups secretly are lying in negative degree. That's something you might or may not have seen before, but it's a general statement to think about. If you want. That's what's called the homological grading convention, and it is the way of making the science having sense and not getting crazy, uh, at least for me. And actually, yeah, this technically proves it. Technically proves only that they are the same as pointed sets, but Ekman Hilton shows they are the same as abelian groups. This is all natural in X and E, so you can just run the Ekman-Newton argument. Remember, if you have two group structures that distribute to each other and have the same unit, or even, well, in this case, it's obviously the same unit. You don't even need that. You just need either to have a unit. Then they are the same and they're the same abelian group structure. Classical argument, you use this. One is given by them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is this clear? And uh, as a, as an using this as an analogy, by definition, if E, F, uh, spectra, we define the eth cohomology of F as pi minus N of map F, E. I won't use this notation very much, but uh, since it is present in the literature, it is uh, worth, uh, it's worth stating. Uh, so that. Okay, and as a lemma, so suppose you have f prime goes to f goes to f double prime uh, exact sequence of spectra, then we have a long exact sequence. Uh, E n minus one, f double prime, no f prime, sorry, e n f double prime, e n f, e n f prime, e n plus one, f double prime, etc. And the proof is just map blank E from spectra up to spectra is a right adjoint. And in fact, uh, well, okay. Uh, this is, uh, now in the same way, put it later in the notes. Okay, this is, will follow in a second. Sorry, I forgot about this. Uh, but it is a right adjoint functor, so it preserves exact squares. And so exact sequences. So you have map F double prime E, map F E, map F prime E, exact sequence. And then you take the long exact sequence in 
homotopy groups. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm doing things out of order in the tensor product to show that. Uh, to show it's the right adjoint to itself. But. Could you maybe shortly explain what the difference to the category of abelian groups is that here right adjoints immediately preserve exact sequences? If I remember. Uh, well, in abelian groups, it's also true that right adjoints preserve short exact sequences. Uh, but, that's, but that's a consequence of this partial stability that I mentioned last time. Uh, the point is that the, the, this functor is a right adjoint, so it preserves pullback squares, for example. But pullback squares in spectra up are pushout squares in spectra. So you're asking whether, so this sends pushout squares to pullback squares, pushout squares in spectra to pull. So it sends cofiber sequences to fiber sequences. Uh, but, uh, uh, oh, actually, there is a detail in, in a million groups, you're right. There is, a, there is a small detail that, in general, this doesn't preserve surjections. So, a, but in spectra, this magic is saying, OK, push-out squares are the same thing as exact squares, and pullback squares are the same thing as exact squares. And yeah, and so that's, that's the magic of stability. Yeah, maybe I should emphasize this. This follows from stability. You're right. In, in abelian groups, you just get it. It's uh, right exact. With the same argument. It's, just, it's literally the same proof. Uh, you don't get the full exactness. Uh, so, I mean, because in general, you can only say it sends push out squares to pull back squares. But in a, in a stable setting, you, these things are the same. So. Because hey, I, I probably should have emphasized it. A pullback square is the same thing as a left exact sequence, and a pullback square with a zero there is the same thing as a left exact sequence. A push out square, sorry. Is a push out square is a right exact sequence. So. But here we don't have to distinguish them. It's very magic and makes a lot of things uh, that you wouldn't expect to work. Okay, uh, but I have some some juice to pay and to show this right adjoint. I first have to prove the, the tensor product. And this is a going like I said, like in a billion groups, how you define the tensor product? You give generators and relations, and then you prove a universal property. And here we are doing. We're going to do exactly the same. Uh, so EF spectra, the tensor product which is sometimes also called as mesh product and written as E smash F, but I'm not going to, this is the older notation that you'll find in all papers until 2005 and also some more recent papers. But nowadays people have pretty much all started using the tensor product as far as I can tell. So I'll use the modern notation. Uh, it's defined like this. So it's a co-limit for n, n in z of uh, let me use the same notation as last time, omega n plus n of sigma infinity e n slash f m. And uh, well, these bounding maps are Maybe I should write a bit of this diagram, how this looks like. Yes. Zero, those two loops, E1 is much F0. And this map is induced by adjoint to 
sigma, sigma infinity is zero, smash F zero, which is sigma infinity of sigma is zero, smash F zero, which maps to sigma infinity E one smash F zero. Remember, we have a map from sigma E zero to, which is sigma omega uh, E one to E one. Sigma E zero, which is equivalent sigma omega E one. So it is adjoint in the same way you get the map from E zero smash F one. Sorry, omega. We have omega square E one F one. And you get a big diagram here. And you take the collimit over all this diagram. And the point is, if you look at older treatments of the smash product of this tensor product I'm defining, uh, they're all they only they're only able to take sequential co-limits because of the limitation in technology at the time. So they have to choose a path across this and prove that the, this doesn't depend on the choice of the path that goes to infinity. Uh, but nowadays, thankfully, we are not limited to to this. And we are allowed to, to do pretty much whatever we want. And we can give this simple definition. So you can feel and think you're taking like pairs. You can think of these as points x plus y and this collimit as, as tensor y, sorry. The pairs of point x comma y here. And think of this collimit as sort of putting the relationship that the tensor product interacts well with spectral structure. But okay, but the reason why I want to call it tensor product is the following proposition, which when we have a three spectra, E, F, K spectra, then there's a natural equivalence. Map the, well, let's see. Map in spectra E tensor F into K and map in spectra from E to the internal home mapping spectrum from F to K. And you should think of these as telling you that maps from F, E tensor F are the same thing as bilinear maps. If you think of the case in, in abelian groups, you have the same home A tensor B, C home from A home B. C. And in fact, this is true also if you take the internal home on both sides. That's easy to, to deduce as a consequence of this. So I'm just going to prove this. And uh, well, okay, this is a long, I'm just going to plug in all the definitions and do a long list of equivalences and you'll see that it's pretty formal from all that I, as you would expect. I mean, I define the tensor product by generators and relations. So this shouldn't be a surprise, but let's do it anyway. So we start here and we plug in the definition of the tensor product. Okay, so far nothing done, Ooh, yeah. So we can put out lim m m maps in spectra. Oh, oh sorry, I forgot omega m plus m. It's important. So here. Okay. Well, I can move since remember omega and sigma are inverses, so I can just apply 
sigma m plus n to both sides and get the formula I actually wanted. And now we can use the sigma infinity omega infinity adjunction. So actually I'm going quite fast. So let me make a pause after this. So the first step is just pulling the colimit out. The second step is just, uh, well, omega and sigma are inverse equivalences. Uh, so I'm using stability here, of course. And the next step is just omega sigma adjunction. And actually let me notice that this has a name. Well, it has a several names. Um, Well, okay, let me not give it the name though. Because, okay, now I want to use the, the universal property of this mesh product in, in pointed spaces. And here I get maps in pointed spaces from maps in pointed spaces from FM omega infinity, sigma m plus m. Oh no, yeah, yeah, okay. Now I know what I want. Okay? Remember a map from a smash product is the same thing as a pointed map to the space of pointed maps. I think we discussed this, okay? So far so good. And now let me notice what I wanted to notice before, that this is the mth space of the spectrum sigma n k. And so if I pull in the one of the two limits, you get limit over m map from space star of f m sigma n k m but now this is just sorry let me copy this e m okay but now this is just maps in spectra it's limit here so this is just maps in spectra from f to sigma and k. And again, well, this, what was this? Well, this is the nth space of the mapping spectrum. And so finally, this is just maps in spectra from E to the mapping spectrum F k, as I promised you. As I said, if you're if everything looks like rather a formal game here, you, you're not wrong. Uh, it's uh, it is a formal game. Uh, we are just putting all the definitions together. Maybe a more conceptual way would be just plugging in this here, plugging in the definition of this guy here, and pulling out everything, and uh, you see that you get a tautology. You're not. Everything is rigged so that this is true. Uh, but okay, let me, actually let me copy these equivalents because I want to write a couple of corollaries. And it's going to be useful to, oh, no, please. It's going to be useful to have it here. So as a corollary, we can take F, equal the sphere and you get that maps in spectra from E to the sphere are 
Yeah, okay. Let me make a remark that I should make before. Maps from the sphere to K is just literally the spectrum K. If you look at what spectrum it is in the definition, it is the spectrum whose nth space is maps from, sorry, it's maps from the sphere to sigma mk, which is uh, omega infinity sigma mk by definition, pretty much, which is exactly the nth space of k. And the gluing maps are the same. So maps from spectra from E tensor the sphere into k is the same thing as maps into spectra from E into k. And therefore, E tensor the sphere is the same thing as E. So the sphere is the unit for this symmetric model structure. And actually, let me, remind, let me remark that from the definition, it is obvious that E tensor F is the same as F tensor E. And OK. Let me put another corollary. Uh, this is going to be a little tricky, but let's say E tensor F tensor G is the same as E, is the same as, actually, let me write it, as colimit N M L, uh, sorry, omega M plus M plus L, infinity E M smash F M smash G L. And so it's also the same as E tensor F tensor G. It's just an associativity. And these follows proof. Well, uh, claiming that the tensor product commutes with colimits in each variable. since it's a left adjoint. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm doing this in the wrong order. Uh, and then plug in the standard presentations of E, F. G plus the next corollary, sorry. Uh, that's bad. I should take more, look at my notes better in which order I'm doing things. But okay, the next corollary is a very easy one. So saying that sigma infinity of X tensor, sigma infinity of Y is the sigma infinity of X smash Y which actually follows directly from the fact that it commutes with colimits in each variable, which is why I wasn't thinking of stating it separately, but let me, uh, let me give you the proof of this. But okay, before I go, go further, is, is clear this first corollary modulo this thing, you just plug in the standard presentations and you get a big colimit in N, M and L. So actually, maybe I should spell it out. So, you know, you get colimit omega m sigma infinity e tensor the colimit omega m omega sorry m sigma infinity e m f m colimit omega l sigma infinity g l. And then, okay, the tensor product commutes with omega because it commutes with sigma and their inverse equivalences. So you can pull it all out and you get the colimit n m l omega m plus m plus l of sigma infinity e n tensor sigma infinity f m tensor sigma infinity g l. And then you apply the, the next corollary and the associativity for the smash product.
And there's actually a tiny bit of care you need to pay attention about the bounding morphisms of this co-limit, uh, but everything works out. That's, uh, just mentioning it because someone might, might be surprised, but it, it, everything works out. Uh, okay, so this corollary now, that's, that's again the... Go. Oh yeah. Again, this is just a matter of, of plugging everything and see that it works. So there we have this equivalence, but then we have the sigma infinity, omega infinity. A junction. And that's uh, okay. That's maps and spaces from X to maps and spectra for sigma infinity Y into E. And again, we have the adjunction. And this gives. Sorry, I'm going perhaps too fast on these steps, but really uh, probably the easy way to, to understand them is to sit down and try to do them on your own. They're just formal games. You just, uh, you just at every step do the only possible thing you could do and uh, somehow you get from A to B. So the first step is, uh, is our adjunction, is our home tensor adjunction. This step is this adjunction. This is definition of map. And this is again sigma infinity adjoint mega infinity. And then the smash map star adjunction. No, no, nothing particularly. Deep going on. Uh, if you've seen them for abelian groups, this is the sigma infinity. You can think of it sort of as the free abelian group. So if you've seen it for abelian groups, uh, this, literally the same formal proofs work. And just we're here. Right. Deduce. Let me put these and actually I'll, I think I'll leave it for you as an exercise. Oops, sorry. So I it was the adjunction property for little map that I was. And it's a bit confusing because it's an adjunction between contravariant functors, which if you've never seen it, it twists a little bit uh, your, your, your head. Uh, but this is telling you that map blank G, no, sorry, map, yeah, blank G, sorry, is a joint to mank blank G op. It's a joint to its own function. This is a functor from spectra op to spectra, and this is a functor from spectra to spectra op. And uh, the, the, you take the same functor as seen as the opposite functor. It's uh, a bit mind twisting if you've never seen it. <laughs> but if you un unwrap what it means, it means exactly this. So it is indeed a, ooh, sorry, that's the right adjoint. Got left and right mixed up. Well, okay, even if you have practice, these things tend to happen. Okay. Ultimately, this is just telling you that maps turned co-limit in the first argument into limits. That's what it's saying. You can you you, you can use the, this property to see that it's indeed true. Why can't we simply 
we should have an injunction with the tensor product, right? This is what we proved above. So we, we do have it, yes. That, that's this, yeah. Why can't you use this adjunction? Is it sort of the wrong kind of uh, the wrong direction? Or? It, uh, it, uh, it's an, it tells you actually that E tensor blank is left adjoint to maps E blank. But we know we want a map in the other direction. Now, you are absolutely right that from these, the step to these is immediate. It's just one line. It's just one equality, basically. It's just E tensor F is the same as F tensor E. Thanks. Well, actually, let me write it this is We know that this is maps E tensor F G. And this is F tensor E G. So it, it, you, you're right that it's just one step, but it's one step that you have to say technically. Okay. Okay, and I haven't defined what a symmetric moral infinity category is. Uh, I will actually in next week, hopefully. Uh, but uh, this is this tensor product. In fact, gives a symmetric moral infinity, a symmetric moral structure on on spectra. I was actually planning to give the full formal proof of this fact, but then I, well, I, I started writing it down and I. Uh, I mean, no one ever gives the full formal proof that something is symmetric monoidal category. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever seen a class not, not concentrating category theory where this happens, that you have to verify all these pentagonal and hexagonal axioms and so on and so forth, even in the one categorical case, and no one ever does. Uh, so I decided I, it's better not, but I've proven for you associativity, commutativity, and the unit, and etc. So I hopefully this is convincing enough. And then you need to check, of course, higher relations and so on and so forth. Uh, and the technique is pretty much the same. It's just more technical and annoying. And maybe I'll say something more when we actually get to the definition uh, of symmetric model infinity category, but which I think will happen next Monday as an example of a, as an object of a different kind of construction, but yeah. And actually, let me give you a note and let me give you a final definition and an exercise, and then we finish this, this topic. So the definition is homology. So now let E be a spectrum and X a pointed space. Then the nth homology is defined as pi n of E tensor sigma infinity X. And as an exercise, and E is H A, E M blank satisfies the Eilenberg steam reduction, Eilenberg steam road axioms. Uh, so excision and uh, and uh, long exact sequence uh, and uh, coprolet and dimension in particular. So it coincides with uh, ordinary with uh, on CW complexes. And that's because you've seen cellular homology, I think you have. And then you do the proof that uh, ordinary, that singular, homo, singular homology is determined by cellular homology. And since uh, this other homology theory as defi I defined has exactly the same properties, you can run the same proof. And so they have to coincide because they both coincide with cellular homology. Don't remember, I don't know if this was done like last year, but. Essentially, the point is every time we have the Allenberg zero axioms, you have to have ordinary homology. It's not. And for these, you might need a couple of things we did about homotopy pushouts last semester, especially the Meyer Vietoris property, I think, that we discussed in one of my exercise sessions.
Okay, this is more to reassure you that I'm not defining the weird notions of homology that we learned defined before. And this actually allows you, so we have seen that for every spectrum there is a cohomology theory, but in fact, this tells you that there is also a homology theory and they come in pairs, the spectrum C is both. And in fact, you can see that this is just the co-limit over M of um, by M plus M of uh, e M smash X. That's also perhaps an exercise using the fact that the tensor product preserves co-limits in each variable. You just plug in actually what you're doing, you're plugging in the, the standard presentation for E and, and unwrap what it means. So let me actually write it, plug in the standard presentation for E. Although this is more because sometimes you'll find this formula as a definition of the homology theory and I wanted to, to tell you where it's coming from. It's not really a good way of computing homology, uh, but, but it's there. Okay, and let me give you the last exercise. Uh, oh no, no, let us actually not give that. It's on the, it's on the, the, the notes, but I think so. Ooh. I feel like I rushed through this material, even if it was rather formal. So nothing of this should have been very surprising for you, but. Mm. Questions? Like a vague question, maybe. So you said that spectra should be thought of as uh, a better way of think of, um, I mean, a better category than abelian groups. And today it was a bit more clear, but it also seems like we have some grading here. In particular, this construction of the tensor product reminded me of the construction of the tensor product of complexes. So yes. Uh, to, to, be, to be completely honest, uh, spectra should also be thought of as a better version of the derived category of abelian groups rather than the, abelian, the purely abelian groups. Uh, but uh, since I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the derived category, um, I didn't want to elaborate too much on that. Um, but you, you, you will see there is an exercise for, for next week where you construct a spectrum for every chain complex, not only for every abelian group. So. And this grading is exactly coming from the shift of chain complexes. Well, okay, it's, it's a generalization rather than comes exactly. But it's a generalization of the shift in chain complexes. Okay, this is- And actually to be better to say, and as we will see soon, uh, spectra are a general, sorry, connective spectra are a generalization of abelian groups rather than dual spectra. Uh, but okay, we will, we will discuss this Thoroughly, it's the main context of it's, it's actually the main topic that we're going to start uh, now. I mean, we have finished with general stuff. And it's... Okay. Oh, actually, I guess I could give you the definition of a connective spectrum since we're at it, since it's actually kind of the right point. E is spectrum is connective if n of e is zero for all n less than zero. And these are actually the things that behave more like abelian groups, technically speaking. But, but now you are also able to shift things in negative degree using this loop functor. So you can think of them sort of like chain complexes of abelian groups somehow. But okay, we will we will discuss this this analogy and make it precise. Uh, very good. Okay, and as an example, uh, H A and sigma infinity X, and in fact, all the spectra that we have defined so far, with one exception, are connective. The mapping spectrum is the only one that we have defined which is not 
connective in general. Uh, you can check. Okay, I don't know if you have enough tools now, but you can check the tensor product, for example, of two connective spectra is connective, and etc. So. Yeah, okay, I'm don't, don't, not sure if you have the tools to prove that yet. But anyway, we, the, there is a reason why we are giving examples mainly of connective spectra, and the reason is because they are the one that arise naturally when you think of abelian groups. Okay. Okay. I have 15 minutes. And a big topic to start. Uh, so uh, I think I'm just going to give you one definition. But if you have questions, it's probably more productive that you ask them now because the, the new topic is, is new. Uh, um, you just said that um, this, uh, the thing you said, connective spectra are a billion or are kind of like uh, a billion groups in a precise sense. Is this then like uh, replacing set with um, spaces? Yes, okay. actually, let me put, okay, we don't have all the, the precise definitions of everything yet, but let me put the statement of the recognition theorem. And oh, I should attribute it to so many people that I prefer not to attribute to anyone just because it's the SMS, but okay. There's an equivalence between connective spectra and uh, infinity groups in space. In infinity category space. In infinity groups, I haven't defined them yet. They will appear next Monday, presumably, where hopefully I will also start the proof of this theorem. Uh, and infinity groups in sets are just ordinary groups. And infinity groups, in fact, sometimes people just call them groups objects in spaces, actually. And it's, it's not, we're not using this terminology mainly not to not get confused with topological groups, which are just, uh, which are which are a different notion. So people use this historical terminology from infinite of infinity groups. But, but that's exactly what this is saying. And this is also how you 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 prove that the Allen McLean uh, functor from abelian groups to spectra is a fully faithful embedding, because it will be obvious that groups in sets embed into groups in spaces. And so, yeah. Cool, thank you. And we will see, we actually use this theorem also to give examples of non-connective spectra. Uh, uh, but okay, that, 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 that's going to take a while. I think it's going to be the last topic before Christmas, hopefully. Maybe just a quick question to this and where then does the abelian come from? Because you. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, this uh, e infinity. Um, uh, non abelian groups are actually what I'm about, what the next, the very next definition I'm going to give you, which are called E1 groups. And actually, there is a whole notion, filtration of notions of EN groups or EN monoids in. in infinity categories that I'm not going to define because it's, uh, I know two definitions and I don't want to give either of them, honestly. I'm just going to do the case of associative and commutative and nothing of these intermediate approximations, but it's a very fascinating story. I wish I, I had the time to, to discuss it. Uh, but we will focus only on the associative and commutative monoid case. Uh, and we will see, in fact, Okay, the next theorem is that E1 groups are the same things as loop spaces. With only loop spaces from loop X. And uh, you can think of connective spectra as sort of loops infinity of something. So that's where the infinity comes from. And then there is a notion of EN for which corresponds to spaces of the form loop N. 
which I unfortunately am not going to have time to talk about. Uh, but okay. Since we said that, and let me give the definition of an associative monoid at least, if not of a commutative monoid. Uh, and then let's call it a day. Maybe I'll, I'll show that this recovers the classical notions for sets as a first thing next time. So, okay, so let T in delta and uh, and that's a, that is a non-empty totally ordered set. Uh, sorry, finite, 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 so important. And so essentially N is of the form brackets, T is of the form brackets M, like this, uh, but it's going to be convenient for, for the writing formulas of just keeping the set without specifying the canonical labeling. So a gap in T is just a pair uh, T, pri T, T prime of elements in T such that T is less than T prime less, strictly less, so they're different. And there exists any S between T and T prime. So for example, well, the only example that we have is T is of these objects. The gaps in T are pairs 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, um, three, four, and blah, 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 n minus one, n. And there is a map. Uh, yeah. So there is for any gap T, T prime, gap t, I'm sorry, maybe I should say gap t is the set of gaps. There is a map from one to t, remember one is just this zero less than one, sending zero to t and one to t prime. Okay, so far this should this is just a minor bit of combinatorics. And uh, in general, I'll write this, this map G of T comma T prime. And when T is brackets N, I write G I for G I minus one I. from one to n, and this is well defined for one less or equal than i less or equal than n. So why am I doing this? I'm doing this because uh, I'm going to give you a definition, one second. So definition, so let C be an infinity category with finite products. then um, associative monoid or just a monoid in C is a functor M from delta up, so it's a simplicial object um, such that for every brackets M in delta, we have this M N, and this goes to the product for I from one to N brackets one along these G I's is an equivalence. Uh, 
and associative monoids in space are called E1 spaces. And let me give you, so this might look very abstract. So let me give you an example of what happens when C is set. Uh, and then and then I think I'll call it a day and I'll, I'll, I'll continue this story next time. So example, let C set, or in fact, any one category. But I'm going to care mainly about set. Um, and uh, M, uh, let me call it M0, an associative monoid. in the classical sense. That is, you have maps M0 times M0 to M0, multiplication and maps from the terminal object to M0, which I'm called one, which corresponds to the, the unit point, uh, satisfying some condition, the associativity, and the unitality. Then I'm going to build such a simplicial object. And the next time I will show that in fact all, all, all such simplicial objects arise in that way. And it's an equivalence of categories. So we can define M of T. This is uh, the set of functions m from gap t into m0. So you can think of m of t as elements of your monoid, one element of your monoid for each gap in, in t. And so if you have a map from t to s, well, you get, I'm going to give you a map from MS to MT. And how does this work? Well, I have a function from gaps in S into M, and I have to get a functions from gaps into T into M. So how do I define it? Uh, I'm going to have to use the product in the monoid, of course, because that's what this is encoding. And so suppose I take a gap, t, t prime, I can look at its image, f of t, f of t prime, and this is not going to be a gap in general. There might be some elements in here. So I'm going to send it to the products of the gaps in f of t or f t primes. So I have ss primes in gap, s such that f of t is less or equal than s is less than s prime is less than f t prime and of uh, s s prime so okay so that's the definition you can check indeed it is a factor let's concretely let's see what happens what happens is that zero well, zero has no gaps. So it's sent just to the one object set. One has only one gap, and so it's sent to M0. And two has two gaps, so it's sent to M0 times M0, the first factor corresponding to 0, 1, and these corresponding to 1, 2. It's actually corresponding to 0, 1. And let's see the maps, what the maps are. Uh, so for example, you have a map. OK, I'm going to write maps in delta, but remember that we are going to pull back things. So. So I have a map from one to zero. 
and this gives you a map from G upper star from one point object to M zero. And this is sending this one point object to the empty product of element in M zero. So this corresponds G upper star is one. Is the map that I called one, just inclusion of the one element. And then, for example, I have a map from uh, one to two that sends zero to zero and one to two. And this is corresponds to the map M zero times M zero. Remember, this multiplies all elements that lies inside the gap. So this is M1, M2 sent to M1 times M2. It's just a product. And, uh, okay, for example, you can look at this diagram. Now you have, let's see, ooh. Am I doing this right? No, one to zero. Let's see. All right. I want to show how the unitality is coming from. And the unitality is coming. There are also other maps from one to two that corresponds to zero goes to zero, one goes goes to one, and this is just gives you the first projection. And this is what I called G1, and there is this map G2. And this corresponds to the second projection. And, uh, and so you have, you have M of two, which is, you have this commutative diagram here. And now I'll stop because I'm out of time and I don't want to overload you, but I want to finish this example. Uh, this is this, uh, this G upper star here into M of one. And this is just a multiplication. And you can consider For example, the inclusion of the unit in the second object, and this is just M of one. And here there is a, um, there is a map coming from the map from two to one that sends zero to zero, one to one, and two to one. And this diagram commutes, and if you unwrap what it means, it's just telling you that m times one is m. So this combinatorics of delta op is encoding the unitality and it's encoding the associativity, and I'll give you a lot more details about this works next time by proving that these are indeed uh, the same as associative monoids in the classical sense that we discussed. Or if you want that this functor from classical assistive monoids to assistive monoids in this new sense is an equivalence of categories. Okay. Sorry for just giving you a definition and half an example. And that, uh... Okay, and this is what A1 monoids. I haven't defined groups yet, but this is coming very soon. Excuse me, I'm uh, a little bit confused. Um, this th this page you wrote here is this for the um, example for the um, set it is for example? it is the set example, but in fact secretly it's also true in every category. Uh, but I I don't want to I, I wanted to work out the example and then show you oh but in fact what the diagrams I wrote which are very concrete in the case of sets in fact, makes sense everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, could you uh, maybe then scroll up to the definition of M on maps? Um, yeah, I, um, 
Do you mean M the multiplication of the monoid or do you mean M the uh, from gap S to M? Oh, you know what? Let me call this alpha. And uh, alpha. so we are, uh, yeah, I, sh I probably shouldn't use the same letter for an element of the monoids and for the multiplication maps. Okay. And actually what I mean here is of course M of this collection, the, the multiplication. Well, okay. When I say here is the multiplication in the monoid. Ah, okay, now I get it. Thank you. <laughs> so you take and you multiply all the elements that fall in the same gap. That's okay. I'll give a lot more details next time. Um, and uh, this is overkill in the case of sets, of course, but we're going to need all the compatibilities when we work with spaces. And uh, the, 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 the theorem I hope to prove next time is that this corresponds to sets and maybe if I manage to get to the end, the fact that these are exactly the Monoids that are actually groups that haven't defined yet are exactly spaces of the form omega x with the composition of paths. And okay, this is not really stable. This is more like an unstable prelude to the stable version where asking also for commutativity will give you infinity loopings and connective spectra. Okay. Other, other questions? No. Okay, so I'll give you more details about this next time. Let me stop the recording and uh,